Well, welcome to uh, today's episode. Uh, today we have the pleasure of uh, having uh, Dr. Stanley Goldfarb on the Akkad and Coco Report. Um, Dr. Goldfarb um, is a practicing uh, nephrologist uh, in Philadelphia. He practices at uh, at Penn, uh, one of the the, the largest uh, teaching hospitals uh, uh, in in Philadelphia. Uh, and he also is the former associate dean of uh, curriculum at a teaching hospital. Uh, Dr. Goldfarb came to my attention because, and came to a lot of people's attention because of a op-ed that he wrote that made the uh, Wall Street Journal. Title uh, was, was somewhat provocative. It says, take two aspirin and call me, call me by my pronouns. Um, and in, in the... Hmm, I'm hearing a lot of feedback. Is that, uh, do you hear that? I hear that, but go ahead. I think if you speak, it will it will drown okay. out. And if, yeah, and uh, and so we're um, so we're just going to get into where uh, where the inspiration for this article came from, Dr. Goldfarb. So, uh. sure. <laughs> okay. So let me let me start by saying um, that the title was very provocative, and it was not my title. The right. title really has absolutely nothing to do with the article itself. The title was supplied by the Wall Street Journal. I'm told that's their uh, habit. Of, of I think it's common practice uh, for, for uh, newspapers to, to pick their own titles. Yeah. And I think actually that was uh, created a lot of the controversy that surrounded this op-ed piece. People took great offense to that. And I, I frankly don't blame them. It has, it really had nothing to do with the point I was trying to make. And, and I had no intention of insulting uh, any individual, I have people can call themselves whatever they want, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so that that's just the one thing I, I like to preface by saying. the The article came about actually uh, because the Wall Street Journal ran a story that 84 medical schools were creating a course in climate change, and um, and I, I had a faculty member who had come and. Uh, I, I wrote in the article, he chastised me. He, he disagreed with that particular verb, but I, I felt like I was being chastised. So I guess I could use that word about the fact that we didn't teach anything about climate change in the medical school curriculum. I pointed out to him that the, I looked up uh, diseases associated with uh, climate change and uh, I really couldn't find anything. I understand there are tropical diseases. We do teach about those, but I saw no need to burden the curriculum further um, with ideas that have a tremendous political component to them, really. And um, so when the Wall Street Journal published this story, I wrote a letter to the editor complaining about the fact that this is, to me, as far as I was concerned, a ridiculous waste of time. In a medical school curriculum, it may be useful in a physics curriculum or some other curriculum where people are actually learning the science associated with climate change, but not in medical school, where it's going to be just a lot of political talking points were going to be transmitted to the students, no doubt. Um, the Wall Street Journal then wrote back and said, well, we didn't, we didn't have an article on climate change. I pointed out that they did have an article on climate change. They didn't know which articles they had, but, but he, <laughs> the, uh, the editorial page editor said, this is interesting, though, and given your position, why don't you write an op-ed piece? So I wrote the op-ed piece, and then um, then it was um, it was accepted. the the points The point that I wanted to make was the fact that um, there are plans afoot in most medical schools, driven by a cadre of educational specialists, really physician, mostly physicians that have gotten uh, degrees, doctor of education, or masters in in education, to really change the medical school curriculum. There's even an initiative called the Beyond Flexner uh, Initiative, which is, seeks to transform medical education and, and spend at least something on the order of a third of the curriculum on something they call healthcare system science, which includes lots of social issues and basically a curriculum to create a, a core of physicians who are advocates, social advocates. Um, and um, my objection is that uh, at a time when Obviously, science is burgeoning, and uh, the opportunity for influencing uh, ill patients and making them better um, is uh, is at a greater uh, degree than it ever before. 
this is not the time to suddenly uh, add uh, a, a component of the curriculum that's that's going to require the removal of a component of a curriculum in order to teach this new material. And my own view is that what's really uh, going on here is not so much an idea that physicians are being taught how to be better physicians, but rather physicians are being recruited to be advocates for a social and political agenda that uh, speaks to many of these issues. And I think for the most part, the public does trust physicians and it would be quite useful for um, one part of the political spectrum to have a, a cohort of physicians that are advocating for particular social um, the social uh, positions. Um, so I think, you know, I think health equity is important, but I don't think physicians can accomplish social change as physicians. They may be able to accomplish change if they want to be sociologists or they want to be advocates, that's fine. And I don't, they, they can do whatever they want. It's a wonderfully free country. I just don't think we should uh, consume the medical school curriculum teaching people about these issues. I That's, don't think they improve patient health at all, patient care at all. It's really about creating advocates. So there are lots of, lots of, lots of uh, um, points that were made uh, in response to that in terms of whether or not you could separate one from the other. But I thought before we got to that, uh, we talk about, we talk about uh, your very unique perspective because you've spent so much time in, ed in medical education in, in that you've seen kind of the, um, uh, the slow progressive arc of change, if you will, uh, where you know tr the traditional American model of medical education has kind of been under attack, if you will, um, since the 1960s and 70s. And you mentioned, you know, an influential critic named Ivan Illich. Um, can you t talk a little bit about about that um, in terms of how you know this, this is this has actually been going on for a long time? This kind of you know attempting to influence and change medical education. Yeah, it's, it is sort of interesting. And, and I'm, again, I'm not a, a sociologist, but um, back in the, in the 60s, 50s, really after World War II, really, there was, there was a, a great deal of movement to sort of change um, medical care, to think about it more from a community perspective. And departments of community medicine grew up. Um, and there was a view in this, in, in this world, Hillich was a social critic, that um, big medicine, technological medicine, really was a failure and that there really needed to be much more of a community focus on medicine and uh, there was a pushback about the medical industrial complex and there was a sense that this high-tech medicine really had, had failed to deliver on the promises that were made uh, in the 50s and early 60s and, and it probably did fail because the technology um, and the promise outstripped what was what we really were capable of at, at those times. Nonetheless, um, you know, technological medicine did dominate, even though there were many people who felt like we needed to to focus much more on primary care and the delivery of care at that level. And um, and I think that uh, high tech medicine was quite successful in recruiting young people to. Um, to fields like cardiology, which burgeoned and nephrology and oncology. These fields were really at, at a very low level of development when I finished medical school back in the uh, 60s. And, um, and they grew very strongly. And I think this, this pushback and this desire to have a, a, a medical core that was predominantly a primary care physician core with the fewest number of specialists that you could get by with was sort of the goal. Now, um, and I think that um, what we're seeing now is kind of a, a continuation of that impulse with the sense that this is a time when, uh, with these transformations that are occurring in medicine, this is the time where the sociologists could get their way and turn medicine back into this field that focuses more on social issues, delivery of uh, community level of health care, as opposed to worrying about the treatment of, of sick individuals. Part of it is how expensive that high-tech care has become. There's a pushback against that. So this is, it's sort of part of this zeitgeist of, you know, getting rid of experts, anti-elitist sort of thinking, uh, having a, a more of a touchy-feely approach to 
to life, a new age <laughs> sort of thing. I mean, I know I, I'm, I'm sounding like just an angry old uh, white man, which I guess perhaps I am. But I, I think that this, what, what's currently been proposed in medical education is, uh, as I said before, is a greater emphasis on these sociologic issues, this idea of population health, where physicians are going to be, primary care physicians are going to be looking at the health of the entire community. And, you know, again, I think this is fine, but I, I still believe that our mission is to care for the individual patient and not to be a public health physician. We have schools of public health. Physicians need to, we need to have public health physicians. We need to have physicians who can understand the drinking water characteristics in a community. But this is not for every physician. This is for a small cadre of individuals who are gonna be involved in that. And one thing, one thing that um, I've been you know, accused of is uh, the idea that you can't take care of patients unless you understand their social milieu. And I would argue that that is an, an incredibly offensive notion that um, we can predict how an individual lives and feels and thinks because of the characteristics of their community. And, and we can. I mean, if people are really different, and just because someone comes from a poor neighborhood doesn't mean they aren't well-educated, doesn't mean they aren't uh, incredibly sensitive, doesn't mean that they can't understand the, the communications that you, you're trying to deliver to them. So I think we need to treat individuals as individuals. And this idea that um, we can't take care of people unless we understand their, the social circumstances that they're in just doesn't make any sense to me. When someone comes in with pneumonia, they have pneumonia. It really doesn't matter if they don't like their job. It doesn't matter if their community has broken windows. None of that matters. We have to cure their pneumonia. And that I think that the focus on the individual patient, the individual patient's needs, is really, in my mind, dominant, and this this current um, impulse to um, to focus on these social issues because you can't take care of patients unless you understand them is, to me, a truly illogical un, uh, idea without any evidence, and one that I was really attacked for. People made fun of me. They said, "How can you possibly care for someone if you don't understand what their income is?" And you know, I just think, really. Uh, you know, how many times has, has someone come in and, and, and said, you know, my income is insufficient and I was able to do anything about that. So right. that's, it, no, uh, that's kind of where this whole yeah. thing is. Yeah, it, 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 it's interesting in, in that it, it, this is the, um, uh, the zeitgeist, as you, as you call it, is dressed up as something that's new. But, but what's, so, what, what was, what's so illuminating is the fact that, you know, this is always, there's always been this undercurrent. Um, uh, that's existed, and you know, as you as you said in your column, you know this uh, in, the influential critic Ivan Illich called the medical industry. This is in the 60s and 70s. I don't know one of those yes. decades. <laughs> he called it an industry. He called the medical industry an instrument of pain, sickness, and death. Yes. Right. And he sought to reorder the field towards an egalitarian social purpose. Now, that's that's you know that's exactly what we hear today. This idea that, and and you know so when when you know. I know the story of uh, transplant very well, and I, I and I know in the in the research I was doing and writing some blog that um, that uh, you know in uh, gracing the, the pages of the New England Journal of Medicine, where was you know a governor of I believe the state of Colorado who was writing an editorial about how we should not be wasting such immense resources on on the few to get transplants. When I mean, think about how many people we could educate with that with those dollars. And again, this was in the New England Journal of Medicine, correct? So it gets to your point that, um, that you know, there's the patient in front of us who's really sick. Um, uh, the technology is, uh, um, you know, we, our job as physicians is to try to take care of that individual patient who, who, who has uh, uh, something bad that's befalling them. And, uh, and, there's, and there's this constant push and pull between folks that want to say, all right, to this person who's super sick, that's going to need a tremendous amount of resources to get them better. Um, should we should we do that, or should we take a take a uh, kind of a, 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 a more backseat approach uh, to to folks like this, and kind of focus in more on population health versus focusing in, in on the uh, on the individual? So I thought that well, was yeah. And, and those people that advocate that are the ones who fly to Duke when they have a brain tumor, <laughs> and then fly back to Mass General to get the proton therapy, 
and then uh, go to the University of Pittsburgh because they have a new protocol that focuses on that. So everything is fine until you're the one who needs the high tech care and then there's no particular interest in, in uh, rationing the care at that point. Absolutely and true. I understand there's no limit to the amount of care that you know, we could provide to the American people, but you know, this is a very wealthy country and it's a good way to spend its money. So that's kind of my, my <laughs> overall view of you, that. I, you, I think, you know, and I think the other uh, concern I have about all this is there's a pretense that the community that we should serve is, um, is, a, is a poor community. That, that's when, when, when they talk about, well, we have to be, we have to take care of the community. It's never thought that we have to, there's a country with all sorts of communities out there. And what we're supposed to be teaching the students is, you know, what's going on in these urban centers, that this is the, the main focus that we have which has led me to wonder about a, a, an interesting issue um, and, and probably one that um, is, uh, is gonna make people even more upset. But I think part of this issue is the fact that these large academic um, medical centers and, and medical schools are located in urban centers and they need to get along with the local political world. And they need not to have to pay um, property taxes. And the only way that you can get along in the political world is if uh, they feel that there's a close alliance between these uh, hospitals and the community. And so I think that's another reason that the focus has been so much on social justice, because almost all these urban centers are run by administrations that tend to be quite progressive, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, uh, you know, Washington, D.C., you know, Los Angeles, San Francisco, take your pick. These are places that have the leading academic medical centers in the country. They are the leaders of, of this whole um, kind of approach to medical education. And they live in these communities that they need to get along with the local community uh, political leaders. And that's the politics of the community. So, and I think that's a reason that they uh, have adopted uh, these attitudes as much as probably the fact that they tend to be individuals who have a progressive mentality and that, right. and they believe that this is the way the world ought to be organized. Certainly some synergy there. You also brought up, um, you also brought up uh, the educational theorist Etienne Wenger, uh, correct? And, uh, and, you know, who emphasized communal learning rather than yes. individual mastery of uh, uh, crucial information. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, uh, about that? Well, that's, that's the other peculiar thing that has gone on in medical education is that in, in years before, the, the individuals who were responsible for medical education, my medical school at the University of Rochester, for example, these were great clinicians, famous clinicians, famous clinician scientists, in some cases, bench scientists, for the most part, famous clinician scientists, who then decided at some point in their career to spend more time teaching, giving back in, in that sense, and, and supervising medical education. Nowadays, the individuals for the most part around the country who get to be the leaders of the educational um, activity in medical schools, which is tends to be a pretty small part of what medical schools are all about these days. They're mostly giant research institutions, but the individuals who run the medical education part now come from the world of formal education training. As I said before, they tend to have masters of education, sometimes doctorates in education, and they bring the world of, of formal uh, academic education, if you will, to medical education. And that world is one which is endlessly tinkering with the way that uh, information is transmitted. They have all these basically unproven educational theories. As far as I'm concerned, if you, if you try to find the evidence for any of these new initiatives, the way education is, is being transmitted, the evidence is as thin as evidence can possibly be. And, um, and so they're attempting to really transform the way medical education is transmitted. So for example, there's this idea of the flipped classroom. And this idea is that students will go and do individual reading and then come in and learn the material uh, in, a, in a more uh, hands-on sort of approach, case-based material, as opposed to coming in, hearing a lecture, having an expert deliver the information, going home and studying it, learning it, going into small groups where they talk about the material, work, work through some of the problems associated with it, 
and then take an exam. So the idea now is that there are gonna be small chunks of information and students are gonna, as I said, work with it themselves. And these are the kinds of things that are going on in, um, in based on educational theories that are really quite unproven. And um, again, you know, uh, for the rest of a physician's life, the way they're going to learn is they're going to either read a, an article or they're going to go to a medical meeting where people are going to prevent, present lectures. They may have continuing medical education lectures as part of their hospital's activities. This, these ways, these, these, edu these uh, experimental ways of educating are only going to be confined to medical school. And um, so this, this bothers me a great deal because again, it's, it's a change, a transformation without evidence that the transformation is needed and without evidence that the transformation is gonna be effective. And I think it, it has a good chance of actually undermining medical education, focusing on multiple choice testing rather than focusing on deep learning of complex pathophysiologic um, uh, issues so that students are prepared and later in their careers to really deal with new kinds of approaches that are gonna be forthcoming. There's an attempt to reduce the science, the, uh, even the, 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 the head of education at Penn made a statement that there's too much science in the curriculum. And um, you know, I, I just think this is absurd. And it, it really suggests that, again, that what the role of the physician is, is sort of a, uh, a social worker as much as being someone who cares for sick people. And again, that represents a choice that's being made uh, based on a social political sort of uh, mindset that now is dominating. So that's the other uh, problem I feel. There's this, this desire to learn in groups. And again, it's based on, on educational theory that, that typically looks at things like if someone goes into a lecture and they're asked a question about it immediately after they, they have little recall. But that's not the way medical students learn traditionally. They would go to the lecture and then they'd go home and study the material. And then they'd have to figure out how this material is relevant and what the, the key information is. So it's never been just a, a, an in-person learning experience. It's been an in-person learning experience followed by intense uh, self-preparation. And I think, again, I'm, I, I object to the fact that there is a, um, this idea that uh, these educational theories, which I think most sentient human beings would, would say that our educational system is, has not improved over the last 30 or 40 or 50 years in the United States in general. And now this, this, uh, this um, breakdown in, in the effectiveness of education is gonna seep into medical schools because the people who created the breakdown in undergraduate uh, schools and in high schools and in elementary schools are now bringing these brilliant ideas into medical education. <laughs> so I don't have pulling, strong feelings pull, about this though. <laughs> <laughs> pulling, pulling no punches at all. No. But um, <laughs> so, so I guess, you know, one of the, one of the many counters is that, um, look, uh, you know, we have, we're in the midst of declining health. Uh, life expectancy for the first time is going down. Um, uh, infant mortality, when you look at, uh, 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 black babies versus, you know, uh, all other babies uh, is, is significantly different. Is it, is it not our job then as physicians to try to sort out uh, why, sure. why that is? So how, uh, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. So let me give you an example from my field. Yeah. So um, the African-American community is disproportionately affected by kidney disease. If one visits dialysis units in the United States, a, a high proportion, way out of proportion to their, um, their representation in the population, African-American patients develop chronic kidney disease. This was attributed to the a stressful life. This, that was the main attribution, that there's lots of hypertension, there's lots of diabetes, and that this relates to poverty, and it relates to the lack of opportunity that African-American individuals had. Well, it turns out and most of the reason for the excess load of kidney disease in African Americans is because of a gene that, uh, that was evolved in Western Africa. And that gene uh, is, is very effective at combating African sleeping sickness. It turns out that if animals are, have this gene transferred into them, they have a much greater risk of developing kidney disease. And this gene 
seems to convey a, a resistance to the African sleeping sickness, but it also conveys a, an increased uh, risk of developing injury to the kidney when an individual is hypertensive or has diabetes. So if you ask me, you know, the, the stress, the, the uh, excess infant mortality in African Americans, is, my understanding is it's not a question of poverty. This is a, a characteristic of a community in general, unrelated to what people's income is or what people's educational status is. So yeah, I think it's important for us to do research. I think it's important to understand when something is related to a particular activity in the community. But again, as an individual physician, I can't change the community. I could change it if I want to be an advocate about these issues, and that's fine. I, I, I think it's perfectly fine if individuals want to go and do that, but we're training people to care for the sick person in front of them. And yeah, research in these areas needs to go on, but the assumption that everything represents a social condition is a, a view that people would like to to make, but in fact, in the, in the example of kidney disease, that just isn't the case. I see. So, if if it's the case that um, it, it so so you're saying that you know, it, I mean, of course, it, it's hard to attribute uh, uh, how much of a disease is related to genes to to, to uh, versus you know your, the environment that you're in, and if if it's if if it's the case that say. Uh, you know, better better screening earlier on for say high blood pressure and, and uh, diabetes. Uh, you know, even if that doesn't reduce uh, kid, uh, uh, kidney disease in, in a certain population to you know to levels that you would see in the general population, you, you would make significant inroads. Um, who should be doing who should be doing that type of screening? Should we be in, should should we be at least uh, informing medical students? of the importance of those of those factors. I mean, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of beating around the bush. I'm talking about, you know, I'm, I'm talking essentially about social determinants of health and uh, sh should we be aware of the social determinants of health uh, so that we can, you know, create nephrologists who, when they become practicing nephrologists, aren't just, um, or, or not just nephrologists, or physicians that, you know, when they mature to be, uh, you know, in, in practice in their neighborhoods, that they make that effort to kind of, screen more aggressively or go into the community or go to barber shops and, and, and check uh, pressures. If we, don't, if we don't kind of impart that information to them uh, in medical school, are we doing the right thing by them? Is that? Uh... Well, you know, I mean, I, you're sort of mixing and matching things. Should we screen? Should we measure the blood pressure of, of, of people in schools? Sure. And that's the that's the, the function of, of public health physicians, and it's the function of the public health department of the city. So those activities go on all the time. Um, you know, should we go into schools and, and check children's vision? Sure, we should do those things. Again, but when a child shows up at children's hospital with a complaint, whoever is there, that's their job, is to, to evaluate that that child and evaluate what's wrong with them and give them the proper treatment. So yes, there are, as I said, there are wonderful schools of public health. There are departments of health in cities. There are huge enterprises devoted to community health. This is what, what, what the impulse is to do this education in medical school is not that. It's not to teach public health. It's to have a bunch of physicians advocate for social justice and health equity because they believe that having more government programs and spending more money and having more dollars spent in schools is going to solve all these problems. And having physicians to be the advocates for this is going to be a very powerful tool. And it no doubt will have a, a powerful effect because physicians, for the most part, are pretty well respected in the community. So I'm all for these programs. The question is who should be administering them? The Penn has a school of social work. The medical school doesn't need to be the school of social work. It has a school of social work. When all these physicians who attacked me said, my God, you know, if I don't ask these questions, I won't be able to intervene. And I say, fine, what was the intervention? And when you look up the intervention that they refer to, it's to refer the patient to a social worker. <laughs> so that's the intervention. What are they going to do? Let's say they find out that there's a community problem. Are they going to then stop seeing patients that day and go and, and deliver food in the community? It's a different problem for a different group of people. 
it's not to say that there aren't physicians that are going to be terribly concerned with these issues. It's wonderful that they are. I, I, I think it's terrific. It's just not for everyone. And, and in fact, you know, I, I can't tell you how many students have, have come up to me, whispered to me, literally whispered to me, thank you so much for writing this. I even got a, 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 an email today from a physician in North Carolina who has a master's of public health who thanked me for writing it and said, you're right, There's, we're spending way too much time on these social issues. This is a public health specialist even saying it. So it's not that I think these issues aren't important. The question is, what's the way to educate people about them? And, and who are the individuals who should be um, responsible for trying to uh, deal with some of these issues? You know, my wife passed away a few years ago. She had ovarian cancer. And my family and I decided to um, have an endowment, which we set up, for poor women who have uh, uh, trouble getting to clinic, who are in the gynecologic oncology clinic, can't pay their rent, can't get enough food, whatever. And, and we, we established that. I didn't take any courses in this. You don't need to... Both, all, all the physicians understand poverty is not a good thing. And we should try to do what we can to alleviate it in any way that we can. And again, we don't need to take a third of the medical school curriculum to tell individuals that if you can't afford your medications, that's a real problem. It doesn't require incredible amounts of teaching in order to convey those ideas. And again, I would just argue that most of these discussions, the students you know, kind of roll their eyes about half of this material because it's stuff that they've encountered their whole lives. They're 25 years old, and we're going in there at that point and telling them, you know, there's racism in society. And they, you know, and it's their answer is, really? I didn't, I had no idea. And, uh, you know, that's, I'm just being, you know, the, right. So it, 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 ironic about this because it's just, you know, the, the sorts of things that are being communicated in these classes are, are not very subtle and very, um, you know, I think terribly useful. Uh, uh, we have, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. Well, let me, let me push back maybe from a slightly different angle uh, on this, because uh, what would you make of, of someone who would argue, who would say that, listen, this scientific technological medicine that has been essentially the model for medical education since Flexner, um, you know, has claimed, right, that it was sort of, uh, that it would automatically lead to better health outcomes and, and, and that sort of thing. But there's nothing in, in science and technology by itself that you know, articulates a, a, a cogent concept of health. Because in many ways, we're sort of relying on our intuition or our own personal uh, view of what is healthy, what is not healthy. But there's nothing in the science itself that says, you know, doing X is you know, a good thing for the health of the patient. Um, and that's why there are so many controversies about, you know, many different issues. The one, you know, the one that was uh, in the title of your op-ed, not that you chose, but the one about transgender, you know, um, uh, treatment and that sort of thing is, is one of them. But there are many others, you know, you could think about over the years. Um, technology doesn't tell us about uh, whether a brain dead person is really dead or not. I mean, that's a philosophical um, uh, question that is sort of outside of the realm of science. Things about yeah, so abortion, things about, you know, I mean, many things. So to, to say that, you know, um, medicine is sort of a, scientific medicine is sort of value neutral, and then society can decide how to apply it or not apply it according to social values. Um, I, I find that a little bit difficult to, to, to buy completely because at the same time, many of the academic medical centers were, you know, in, in the 30s and 40s, I mean, when the uh, U.S. healthcare system was, was getting developed, were holding key positions to, or, to help organize how healthcare, you know, essentially came to be. And that was very... I mean, to an outsider, so an outsider could see it as, as kind of self-serving. Academic medical centers did very well. Technological medicine did very well because there were institutions that reimbursed this sort of generously and so forth. So, so one might, might say that, listen, you know, you, you pretend to be value neutral, but at the same time, you know, you're getting the lion's share of things. You're, you're ignoring these other ethical, philosophical, social issues. But 
you know, at some point, you know, they're going to be, have to be dealt with. And if you're not going to deal with them yourself, we're going to invade your medical school and, and take charge of your curriculum. So I'm not, I, I disagree with your critics on, on what their philosophical views are, but I think the arguments may, may hold some water. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, again, I, I think, um, I think that um, you can make a strong case that, um, I think, I make the strong case that it's really about the individual patient, that there's no such a thing as what's right or wrong in medical ethics in the sense of, you know, whether you should promote someone's desire to end their lives or not. Um, I think it, I mean, my personal view is I'm, I'm totally opposed to that because I think people make mistakes and maybe that's a, a bad thing to, to pick. But the idea of how you want to be treated is an intensely personal uh, kind of decision that needs to be made in discussion with the patients. Uh, and, it, and you can't make um, sort of presumptions about a community's sense of values about this when you're talking about an individual patient. So again, I, 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 think, I think it's important for medical students to be um, aware of the sorts of psychological defense mechanisms, for example, that people use when they're confronted with stress. So you can help them work through their illness. I think that's really important. But I don't think that we should spend time worrying about um, whether the temperature is going up in, in um, the, the South Pole, for example, when, it, when we're trying to teach individuals how to care for sick individuals. And you know, there was a, to go back to this historical question that was raised, there was a famous um, lecture that was delivered by Donald Selden, who was a, a brilliant uh, physician who actually founded the University of Texas uh, Southwestern Medical Center, where you know, there are three or four Nobel Prize winners. And he was one of the giants of medicine in the latter part of the 20th century. And Selden gave a, a lecture called The Boundaries of Medicine to the Association of American Physicians, where he, again, back in 19, this was in 1981, I believe. And again, this sort of, these issues came up. And his, his view was, again, that medicine needs to stick to care for the individual patient, that medical ethics are really, when you really think about it, sort of an absurdity, because every patient is going to have their own set of values that you have to deal with. And bringing your particular values, which ends up what's happening in some of these discussions, really doesn't make any sense that it, it, because of the individuality of human beings, you have to deal with them on their own. So I'm not arguing that it isn't important to be aware of these issues. It's one of the reasons that medical students are supposed to go to college before they go to medical school. They're supposed to learn literature. They're supposed to learn history. They're supposed to learn psychological issues. They're supposed to be educated, really well-educated individuals who now are ready to learn to be doctors and to sort of infantilize them, which is what goes on here, and also make these assumptions that we understand what these social values ought to be and how they ought to approach these things, when in fact what, we, what they really need to do is to learn about illness and then deal with patients and bring these experiences that they had both through literature and through their own personal experiences to, to this discussion. And I, I just think, you know, when I go and see a sick patient, and I, I was seeing sick patients last week, I go in there and, the, and you have to find out what this, what's important to this patient, not what's important to their community, what's important to them. And there are some people that are, that, you know, come from other countries. We have like something like 75 different nationalities that live in West Philadelphia. So what does it mean that I'm learning what the community values when there are 75 communities there, for example? So right. I, I just think given the complexity of medicine and given what our job is, we need to focus in medical education on the job of worrying about the individual patient and not worrying about some of these issues that are important to society, but not really necessarily important to that individual who's in front of us with an illness. So, you know, so I happen to agree 100% with you that, you know, to me, medicine is about treating the individual because health really pertains to the individual, you know, uh, primarily. Um, but that I would, uh, I mean, I, 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 I wager is actually a philosophical opinion. And, and the other side actually disagrees with us. The other side has 
you know, uh, concocted this concept of population health. And, and if you read the literature about population health, they really view the population as primarily, you know, health as being attributable primarily to the population, irrespective of how that, what happens to the individual. So philosophically, they have a completely different conception of health than you and I have. And so there's a struggle here between, uh, you know, two different concepts of health, but the other sides will say, well, you guys have the monopoly and you've had the monopoly for, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, and now it's our turn to come in and sort of <laughs> boot you out of there. And do what? And well, do what? That's the question. It'd be a catastrophe. <laughs> it'd be an absolute disaster. So I'm not, I'm not disagreeing. But, but again, to, 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 to go back to, uh, I mean, imagine, imagine you were um, given the power to, or the resources to open a medical school in Saudi Arabia. Would it be exactly the same? I mean, would it be the kind of scientific, uh, would your curriculum be the, exactly the same as the one that it is here in the US? I, I would imagine that it'd be different, right? Because it would adapt to the values, the philosophical, the ethical values of that country. And, or you could say, no, 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 we're going to be completely value neutral and be purely technological, in which case medicine becomes in a way, indistinguishable from veterinary medicine, right? I mean, the human species is just a biological animal and we're gonna understand the biology, but not you know, pay attention to these. So my point is that the country right now, the, the, and, and it has been going on for decades, but it's very, very divided and, and more than it's fragmented in terms of very powerful, different ideologies. Yet medicine is sort of, by virtue of the way it's uh, through Flexner, the licensing system, the organization that uh, regimented the curriculum, it's sort of a monopoly. And we have to have one medical school model for the entire country. And, and you've been talking about, you're trying to defend a certain view of what the medical curriculum should be. In, in my opinion, we should, what, what would you think about uh, saying, no, what, what we need to do is uh, uh, deregulate and have different medical schools have their own. I mean, it'd be the Goldfarb view, and I would send my kids if they want to go to medical school to the Goldfarb Medical School, and then there might be the you know population health, you know community whatever concept of health they, they wanna they wanna have, and they can have their own medical schools and and let things compete. But so long as we have a monopoly in medical education, and essentially a set curriculum that's going to be adopted by all medical schools throughout the country. We're going to run into political problems, and what what do you say to that? <laughs> if I well, uh, you know, again, I, I I sort of say if if the individuals who think that the focus ought to be on the health of the community, you know, the question is, what are you going to do about that? Now, when you when you start reading some of the literature about this, what what they talk about is to develop some protocols that you're going to use for the care of patients in a community. That's, that's really what they, when they talk about population health, so we want everybody in the community to have a cholesterol of X, and that's the goal. So we're going to create this kind of uh, approach, and that's, and that's, that's fine. I, no, that's it's, okay it's not fine, actually. It's, it's a monstrosity. <laughs> I think but, it's a... <laughs> but, but, but that's not really what is going on here. The question isn't, you know, should we teach students algorithms for care. Yeah, we do teach them algorithms for care. I think the time will come when we have enough detailed information about patients that we can have algorithms for individual patients that really are different from the algorithms for the next patient who comes in with the same disease. I think that's where we really need to go with algorithms, and, and, but that's going to take a long time for, for the, the systems to develop that will allow that kind of detail for individual patients. This is different. This is talking about the fact that people aren't getting enough food in the community. People aren't getting the, eating the right kinds of food at home. People aren't, people aren't uh, have enough money to have childcare. People are under stress because uh, there's violence in the community. This is what these social discussions are about in medical school. And I understand these are, these are real problems. These are terrible problems. They're not problems that a physician can solve as a physician. They're problems that social workers can help solve. They're problems that politicians can help solve. Now, if physicians want to become politicians, fine. That's great. And then they can start to address these problems. As long as they're seeing, you know, 25 patients a day in cardiology clinic, 
their job is to treat atrial fibrillation and it's not to treat the fact that there's a food uh, desert in, in a, a certain part of <laughs> right. Southwest Philadelphia. No, but right, and that's I, really I, my question. I'm, it's not that I'm, I'm, I think I'm very concerned with when an individual comes in and has a social problem that prevents them from getting the care they need, then I need to try to address that, that social problem. And the way I invariably try to address it is to send them to a social worker who has the tools to allow, to at least try to deal with that problem, whether it's getting transportation to their dialysis clinic, whether it's arranging for them to get transferred to a place that's closer to their home. And I mean, of course, we're concerned with these issues, but they're, they're issues related to their care as, as individuals with illness rather than the general social problems of their community. Right. You also mentioned, um, you know, one of the one of the things that I'm getting uh, from reading your op-ed and 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 now talking to you is that um, is that there's a there's a certain politicization of of some of these issues, and you just feel, and you feel that you know physicians need to kind of stay in their lane. Um, so you specifically, you know, the op-ed starts out with the American College of Physicians says its mission is to promote the quality and effectiveness of healthcare. Um, but it stepped out of its lane recently with sweeping statements on gun control. Um, so I guess that implies that uh, that that gun control is, or, or, or the ways to deal with gun control, um, is something that's political and is not is something that's outside the purview of science. Even though you know trauma bays are, of course, in, in, in inner cities are filled with uh, un unfortunate young men and women that have you know that have that have been shot and are, are victims of gun violence um is it is it your thought that the empiricism here is i mean there is it's not really empiric it, you know it's it's just very political and there's multiple uh, uh multiple approaches to this and 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 you think that physicians shouldn't be um t picking one side yeah i don't own a gun you know i don't think it's a great idea to to have guns. I don't think it's for terrible use. It's not like I'm a I'm a, a gun advocate in any way. I think the point there was as as a, a particular example of something that's an incredibly political issue, where most of the politicians what they want to do isn't going to address one whit of the problem of guns in in the inner city and all the violence amongst young people who are shooting each other. And it's a perfect example of let's go into a political thing that's going to make us feel good and it isn't going to make one bit of difference to anyone. And the emergency room doctors were outraged when I said this because they said, my God, I'm going to take care of them. They're going to get shot. I'm going to patch them up and I'm going to go out and they're going to get shot again. And I say, yeah, and what are you going to do about it? And having and the, the sort of the recommendations that are out there are recommendations that if you're gonna adopt the political recommendations, they're not gonna change anything at all here. So to me, oh. it's another example of, the, it's fine. Make, if you wanna, as a citizen, if you feel that way, that's fine. I just don't think as a physician that you should be actively involved in something that really is a very complicated issue. It's a, it's a legal issue, it's a constitutional issue. It's, it's, it's one that has a incredible political dimensions to it. And this is not a great place for physicians to be. And I know physicians feel very differently about it. And as citizens, they have a perfect right to be involved in these. I just don't think we need to teach it in medical school. And again, my focus here is not on what physicians should be doing, how they should talk to their patients. It's what we should be teaching medical students. What should we be spending our time? They only go to school for four hours a day. We have to give them at least three or four hours in the afternoon to themselves. If we're not teaching them science and we're teaching them other things, then we're not teaching them science. And so when all this is said and done and they go out to practice as physicians, are they going to be as well equipped as they ought to be? And that's the point here. And if somebody wants to take on and, and become a city councilman and, and try to confiscate everyone's guns and have a buyback program, great. I would love to see no guns at all in the world. It would be a wonderful place. But you know, in terms of how we should spend time teaching medical students, I just don't think that we should be, um, that, that's how we should spend our time. Time is, is the precious commodity here. We have no course in nutrition, for example. But it's we not have just... no course in urology. We have no course in musculoskeletal medicine. They learn a little bit here, they learn a little bit there, and then they finally go out into other fields, and are they going to really be prepared uh, if they're an OBGYN 
uh, physician and their patient comes in with a particular kind of pain, are they going to be really understanding of how they should treat that patient because they didn't have a course in that in medical school because they had a course in, um, in how to um, deal with in political advocacy, which is one of the goals. If you look in academic medicine, the Journal of the uh, American Medical Colleges last month, there was a whole article about how to put an advocacy curriculum into medical school. That's what this is about. And right. that's great. If you want to do that? That's fine. Don't waste the time of medical students with that. Uh, Dr. Right. Goldfarb, you know, they, I, I agree with you 100%. At the same time, um, <laughs> you know, more and more people cite, because um, it's, it's, it's obviously an old idea, uh, Rudolf Virchow, the, patholo the, you know, the 19th century pathologist, was a socialist and he had a famous quip that medicine is political at the end of the day. <laughs> everything pertains to, to, you know, everything that pertains to medicines pertains to politics and vice versa. And, and I'm afraid that there's a growing number of people who believe that, who believe uh, that very strongly and, um, and, and therefore are going to, to invade. What are your thoughts? I mean, how, uh, you know, you're doing very good. At least you're, you're raising the question <laughs> on a, in a prominent uh, journal. You're going against the grain of the the general medical academic establishment, which generally, which so far has been going along with the population health um, uh, perspective, as far as I can tell. So there may be people who've been keeping silent, who are now maybe find a little bit, maybe a little bit more emboldened to speak out. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I, again, I think there's a. Um, there was a, a very uh, good article in the Wall Street Journal this past week about undergraduate education and a sort of a philosophical piece. And one of the points that was made is that the faculty has no idea how admissions go in undergraduate schools. They have no idea. And I think the faculty has basically very little idea uh, how undergraduate medical education is being run and what the goals of it are. I think it's been very much dealt with by small numbers of people like me. <laughs> Right. People like me have been the ones who've done it. We, we sit in, a, in an office and how the curriculum is going to go. And I think the time has come for the faculty to step up because while one of my colleagues, whom I have great respect for, wrote on Twitter, one of the few Twitter items I looked at said, well, Stan Goldfarb is, is by himself. He doesn't work anywhere else. And I've had at least 75 faculty come up to me write to me, come up to me, talk to me, call me to say, I really, thanks so much for writing that. I totally agree with you. I wish that we had uh, less of this going on and more science because the students are really, I feel like they're not prepared the way they need to be. But uh, the that, same, this is great. But at the same time, what was the official response, if we may ask about the, 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 your school? Was, wasn't well, there an official you know, response? This, I, I think the school, well, I personally think the school over responded. I mean, if I were in charge, I would have ignored this guy who's writing these <laughs> things that I really didn't agree with. And that would have, I would have just gone away, like perhaps I, I should have. But, um, but their response was to such a full-throated uh, um, progressive uh, litany of issues that the school stands for, including so just, just, inclusion, just yeah. inclusion and, um, you know, and diversity. And there's absolutely nothing in my article except of course that title that any of those things this is not about inclusion and diversity it's about you know a, a need to shift the focus to science and away from issues that are unrelated to the care of patients which i, I still say it, that i'm not convinced that the care of individual patients depends on understanding what's going on uh, um, right. how much stress they have in getting to work in the morning for those, for those who may not have been... Now, now, I must say, you know, psychiatry is a different field. I mean, psychiatry is a field in which these, these issues of what's going on at home are absolutely critical to the patient's mental well-being and, and may produce actual issues which end up requiring very specific, uh, typically pharmacologic therapy. And, um, you know, that's, that ends up being a, a different story. But... Um, but the school's response was to a sort of um, litany of uh, progressive ideas that, yeah. uh, that I had apparently violated. It, it, it's, worth, it, it's worth just going, it's, it's a brief response. And it said that, please know that the views expressed by Dr. Goldfarb in this column reflect his personal opinions, do not reflect the values of the we, we deeply value inclusion diversity as fundamental effective healthcare delivery. 
Uh, they then go on to say that, uh, you know, they're committed to ensuring a rigorous and comprehensive medical education that includes examination of many social and cultural issues that influence health from violence within communities to changes in the environment around us. So they, they kind of gave a, uh, you know, a rebuttal in, in effect to, 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 to what, what you had uh, said. What does it say? Uh, oh, then there's also a Medscape column that I, uh, a bunch of former um, uh, Penn graduates and current Penn graduates uh, signed on to publicly by, you know, 168, 200, or what's so, I don't know how many people, 100. I, I found it really, really interesting. I was on Twitter um, uh, as well while all this stuff was coming out and uh, trying to make, uh, uh, trying to um, kind of push back a little bit at this kind of outrage uh, uh, that, that, that was there. Um, but it, it's really interesting to me that the folks that are on your side, and there are a significant number that are on your side, feel the need to be hidden about yes. it. Uh, they feel the need to not say anything about it. Whereas, you know, the, uh, uh, whereas the folks on the other side, you know, they're all in public and uh, uh, signaling uh, uh, this for the world to see. What, what is it? What, what, what does that... Um, say about the kind of the environment that we're in at the moment yeah it's very interesting you know they are virtuous and you're in that you know to adopt that creed you're not a virtuous uh, person um and um i think that's part of it uh, part of it is uh, you know the, the art the kinds of responses i got was you know i came to medical school to i came i want to be a doctor to help people and how could you possibly say these things and i I would just argue that, you know, I think if they're ill by figuring out what's wrong with them and getting, giving them the right, that's the best thing you can do for people. And, you know, I got, um, <laughs> I got a, a typical sort of response I got from physicians was a letter I got from a, psych, a psychiatrist, actually, who had been a at Penn for many years. And he wrote, he wrote a letter to me and he, copied it to the dean of the <laughs> medical school as well. And his comment was, I've been practicing psychiatry for 46 years. I've never had someone come in and complain about inequality. And, and, that, you know, it, and that was sort of the theme of it. And social issues were not the problems, people's problems were personal issues. And you know, this idea that these social issues are, influence health, I don't know, maybe they do. It's pretty hard to show it though. I know there are some examples, certain cardiologic conditions which you can show that stress exacerbates and certainly hypertension can be exacerbated. There are examples of it. I actually studied under George Engel who was the, the, the individual who most promulgated these ideas of the, of the social condition of the patients. In the end though, the evidence, these are your influences Again, I would point to this issue in nephrology where we were told over and over again, it was stress, it was stress, it was stress, it was social conditions, it was diet, it was all these things. No, it was none of those things. Yeah. It was a gene. Thing is and, you know, and I suspect that you're going to find as time goes by more and more that the genetic basis for a lot of conditions that have been attributed to social factors actually are the case. Gun violence, violence in general, you know, sure, these are these are terrible problems. But what are you what are you going to do about it as an individual physician, as an advocate? Fine, go advocate all you want. But I don't think it should be a course in advocacy. Now I understand that's my opinion, and um, but it's an opinion that's shared by by many many people. And why it is that the yeah. only people that are willing to be verbal about it are people that have come to the position of. Um, of, uh, that these social issues are incredibly important. I would just ask them, give me some examples where you, the, knowing what this social condition is has really made a difference. It, it sounds wonderful, it's all great, but tell me where, you've, where your advocacy about you know, gun control has led to one person not ha getting shot. And you know, should, should you tell people to lock guns up if they have them in their house? Yes, you should tell them that, period, that's it. Beyond that, tell me what you've done. Do you think that, uh, just getting back to that, why, I mean, why aren't there more folks like you speaking up about this? I mean, clearly you have some type of protection. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, are they- I'm old. That's my protection. There's nothing they can do to me anymore. <laughs> they can fire me. I don't care. But that, I think it's, you know, really, I, I think most people, they don't want to be ostracized. They, they want their colleagues to 
you know, be comfortable in their presence. And, um, you know, I have people who won't look at me in the halls now. Um, but, yeah. you know, I just feel strongly about this. And I feel that, you know, someone needs to, to stand up. And I think the faculty need to get involved. And if the faculty say, you know, Stan, you're just, you're totally wrong in this. We've all thought about this. We voted about this. This is the kind of curriculum we want. Well, fine. I think the profession should step up and say, this is the way we want medical students to be educated. And that's really, I think, the, the most, the strongest message I, I, I want to deliver in all this is that I think the faculty needs to get involved and, and, and render their opinions about how education should go. And in fact, I understand that there's a, uh, a movement even at Penn where the, the chairs are going to be, the chairs of the various departments are going to be consulted about how the education should go. And I hope maybe I precipitated that a little bit, as opposed to just, you know, let a few people who are, um, have administrative roles to be the ones who decide how much time should be spent on topic A, B, and C. I think the time has come for the faculty to step in, for the profession itself to um, make these comments and not leave it to the administrative leadership and not leave it to big organizations in medicine that have all sorts of agendas, including political agendas, in order to, uh, to get what they want. You know, at the AAMC this year, again, the academic uh, uh, organ organizing body for, for that deans run and the Association of American Medical Colleges, the keynote address was on the incarceration crisis in the United States. That was the keynote address at their annual meeting. Now, that's an important issue. And the speaker is a wonderful human being, and it's an important social problem. But really, really, is this the role of physicians? Well, I mean, the ACC did. I think the ACC is planning on having Bono or something at their next opening. So <laughs> that may be more relevant <laughs> than that. Um, I, I'm, a little, I'm a little nervous. Um, you know, it's not that people can't have different opinions about this, right? I mean, some people, look, I think what I'm getting from you is that you really, really feel strongly that, that, you know, when the patient is sick in front of you, that it, it, seems, it seems unlikely that you're going to be able to make a significant uh, difference to patients by fo focusing on social determinants of health. Uh, you think this is beyond the reach of medicine. And, and, and I think that's a, that's a reasonable position to hold, whether or not someone agrees or disagrees. My big concern, my, my, almost my bigger concern is that it's, it, 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 it's clear that if you feel that way, that you are to be ostracized and be regarded as some immoral person that, you know, should have nothing to do with teaching or, or whatnot. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm, it really makes me worry about the state of academic medicine today that, uh, that you can't seem to have a reasonable conversation about this, that, you know, the only people that can talk about this are folks that have the, uh, the courage and are old enough, I guess, to, <laughs> to do it. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make me feel good about uh, the trajectory that things are going to take if, if uh, people are uh, so cowed down. Well, I mean, this is not academic yeah. medicine. This is every place. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, I mean, they, set, the they way, set the tone, I guess. This is the way things are. I mean, I was told I was being unprofessional because I went public with this idea as if this is only an issue for the, you know, for, for the academic the academy, and this is not an issue for the public. This is the public. If you tell people that we're spending a third of the curriculum on social issues, they look at you like you're nuts. What are you talking <laughs> about? They say, that's not why I go to the doctor. So that's, and again, you know, you said, well, the, the, the social determinants of health and medicine should be involved. I agree, medicine should be involved, but not every doctor should be involved. If you want to do that, there's schools of public health. There's the Bloomberg School of Public Health. You may have heard of this guy, Bloomberg. There's, Penn has a public health program. Get your degree in public health and go focus on it. They were, they're saying, one of, I was attacked because of the water in Flint. This is a public health problem. This is not a problem for an internist who's there. Now, he should be able to recognize lead poisoning. I agree with that. But he shouldn't be the one who changes the pipes that go to the homes in Flint, Michigan. That's a job for someone else. So it's not that you shouldn't be aware of these things. The question is, what should we spend our time in the curriculum? I'm, I'm being very concrete about this. I'm not making a large philosophical statement about how, what medicine is like and what health is like. I'm making a statement of how we should teach medical students and what we should teach them and how much time we should spend. And I'm told that this is a false dichotomy. We can do both. 
Well, you can't do both because there are only so many hours in the day. If you want to teach more and more, and, and again, this is what's going on in the future. I was responsible for the curriculum for 13 years. We teach plenty of things about social determinants of health in the curriculum. I think there's too much, but not by much. But what's being planned in the future is climate change. What's being planned in the future is advocacy. What's being planned in the future is inequality discussions. And these, these approaches that are being proposed by the, the Flexner um, initiative and all are to really make this transform uh, the, the education of medical students into something that, that looks more like it's, why did you stop Getting doing to be social workers? Yeah. Why, why, why did you stop being involved in uh, the medical education piece of it? You said you were there for 13 years and you're not doing it any longer. Well, they decided that I was, uh, I mean, you have to ask them. I was never really told why I stopped doing it. I, I was told that my position was eliminated, that there's a new director of, um, I think it's uh, discovery I don't know the names of the people, but I've been replaced by a number of people. It's another issue in medical education is the proliferation of, of bodies that are involved in these issues. I mean, it's just truly uh, ridiculous as far as I'm concerned, but uh, and committees and bodies and, uh, and more administrators and more administrative people. Um, so I think, and, and I, these opinions, I've expressed these opinions <laughs> I suspect that my expressing these opinions represented um, a set of opinions that nobody really wanted to hear anymore, and um, and that's why. So yeah, you know, well, that's uh, we we uh, th 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 we are we are incredibly happy that that you had the uh, <laughs> cojones to uh, to express these opinions, uh, and uh, really really wonderful to to see that uh, you know it it makes me more hopeful that uh, there are. There's at least a strain of thought in in uh, you know ac in academia that um, that that is uh, uh, you know pushing back at some of these larger forces. So uh, so anyway, so 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 thanks, thank you, uh, thank you for doing this. It's wonderful. And then thanks, of course, for coming on. Really, it was really great to come on and, and chat with you. So but by the way, I'm in. I'm also in. I don't know if you know. I'm also in Philadelphia. So we'll have to at some point. <laughs> would love to be able, love to be able to meet you. Have a beer. <laughs> uh, exactly. uh, Dr. Goldfarb, are you on Twitter uh, officially or do you have, can people follow you or follow what you're writing? Do you have a blog? I don't, or you know, like I, I, I've really chosen not to go in that <laughs> okay. that's, direction. That's fine. I mean, I just wanted to, to know if, if uh, yeah, there was something. Yeah, like it's just, okay. um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's kind of a swamp. <laughs> All right. It sure is. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Have a good evening. Right. Take care. Good night. Bye-bye.